one. Welcome guys. We are on conversations with one percenters. And today I got Charles Lykoff. Charles Lykoff is a fractional CF. He, ha he helps uh, accountants, correct? Mm-hmm. Fractional CFO. I don't want to butcher it. So help me out here. So what I do is I help uh, accountants become fractional CFOs so they can earn more and get a lot of their time back uh, by serving their clients. So that's what I do. And you help them stop making peanuts for dollars. I've seen one of your advertisements. Honestly, I'm getting hit with them every single day now. <laughs> ever since we've, we've connected, I've started to see your advertisings on oh, Facebook. And... I'm sorry I'm bombing you all over the internet, man. No, no. <laughs> I saw one of them is like, Hey, I stopped helping accountants make peanuts. And I, and I feel that cause like, I'm not an accountant, but I'm currently making peanuts. So I, I, I can kind of feel their pain. You know what I mean? <laughs> Absolutely. It, it's a, uh, it's language that everyone relates to. And that's why the ads do so well. Yeah. So today I really want to dive into your story. I want to learn more about you, like how you came about your entrepreneur journey and um, what really motivates you to keep going? You know what I mean? Because like, there's there's points where you're like, man, I've made it. Or uh, I just kind of want to know your legacy, like what you want to leave behind on this earth, and like some of the challenges, some of the struggles you faced, the wins and successes. Like I, I'm here to hear it all today. Cool. Well, perfect. Thank you so much for having me, man. Really appreciate being on your podcast. Get to talk to you, your audience, and I think it'll be a lot of fun. Same here. I'm ready. All right. So. Can you walk us through the moment you decided to leave your corporate job? Oh, gosh. Um, so it really starts before that. I think it starts like when I realized that that was something I could do. Okay. Right? And so um, I'll tell you the story of like how I got into being a fractional CFO because I, I got here kind of by accident. And what I mean by that is, it is what, 2017? Um, I'm living in New, New Jersey at the time, and um, my wife finds someone in a Facebook group, and they need help with like a budget and forecast. And so I work at a really large company, you know, hundred billion dollars a year in revenue. It's massive. I work I work in finance there, and her and I've been talking about entrepreneurship for a while. Like I've read all the ClickFunnels books and the Russell Brunson stuff, and like I'm following the Dan Henry and like all these other guys. And I was like, oh, I, I want to get into entrepreneurship but I don't, I don't really know how, like I've done some like Shopify stuff before and I don't like a made business and whatever else, but like really I, I had a corporate job and I was kind of stuck there and I, I wanted something more, but I didn't, I didn't really know how to get into it. And my wife says she meets this lady in a Facebook group and she needs help with like a budget and a forecast, like really easy financial stuff. And she tells me, she's like, Hey, you should message this lady. And my first response is like, no, it's not really worth my time. Like, this is dumb. Like, just kind of kind of blowing her off. Like, just honestly, 100% blowing her off. It's like, this is, this is not worth my time. And that was on like a Tuesday. So Wednesday rolls around and I get home from work. And she's like, hey, Charles, did you, did you message that lady I was telling you about? And I was like, no. And I, I just want to be like, oh, like, like, you know, look, it's not worth my time. Uh, she's not gonna be able to pay me. I had all these misconceptions and like small businesses and all this and whatever else. And so I was like, you know what? I, I don't think I'm going to message her. And so the very next day comes by and she goes, um, did you message this lady? Like, I really, really think you should like, just, just do it. And at this point I, I'm just aggravated and I'm like, you know what? Fine, whatever. I'll, I'll send her a message. Um, first pro tip. If your wife tells you to do something three times, you should just listen to her intuition. You should just turn off your brain and do it. Um, like we weren't married at the time, she was, she, we were engaged, but like if someone has a really good hunch and they've told you three times, you should listen. And here, here's why. So I send the lady a message on Facebook and I was like, you know what? Hey, I can help you insert. I've done three really impressive things, you know, manage budgets that are hundreds of millions of dollars a year, you know, whatever else, like just trying to be like, Hey, look, like, you know, arrogantly, like put this lady in her place. Like, yeah, I can, I can help you. But like, here's why, uh, I'm, you know, important or special or whatever. Like I was just being arrogant. I was like, oh, small business owners, they don't know what they're doing. I was wrong, but we'll get to that. And so I get on a Zoom call with her. And if you, if you have ever been in a corporate office, they have these things called like phone rooms or like phone booths or whatever. You just kind of lock in. It's like, imagine like a really like a, a ceiling to four cubicle with like a door on it. And so you can take okay. private phone calls there. And so I go in on my lunch break. And I bring my laptop there and I, and I get up and I get on zoom 
and this lady owns an advertising agency. And so I hear that she needs um, help seeing if like which clients are profitable, which ones are not. Like, you know, maybe you spend 100 hours working on one client and you spend 10 hours working on another one, but you don't track that. Maybe you should build them separately. You know, maybe you should focus your time better. So she didn't know how like profitable she was per client. Well, that's a really easy thing for me to fix. And so that and a couple other things I did um, for her, I was like, you know what? At the end of the call, I was like, you know what? I'm going to, I'm just going to tell this lady a price that I think is ridiculous. I'm going to tell her something that is like so dumb that she's just gonna be like, oh yeah, I, I can't afford that. And she's just going to get off the call. And so in my head, I come up with something that I think is outrageous, something that is wild. And so I tell her, hey, it's going to take three months to fix all the things you need to do. And it's also going to be $7,500 a month. And I need that all paid up front. And so what she did is she leaned forward and she goes, okay. <laughs> and so at this point, my mind is blown. My first thought is, oh, shoot, I should have said way more money. Um, my next thought was, is I don't have a way to charge a credit card. I don't have a way to like mm. do any of these things. And so I, I knew I had to take down her credit card information. So I wrote it down on a piece of paper and that was either like a Thursday or a Friday. And over the weekend, I opened a Stripe account and on Monday during my lunch break, I charged her. And so my first time working as a fractional CFO, I took the one hour sales call. And at the end of the one hour sales call, I collected $22,500. Now, granted, I still had to do the work for her for a couple months, but that's when I knew I was like, huh, maybe I'm on to something here. And so I ended up doing that for a couple of years and became CFO of another company before I quit my job. But that's like how I got introduced to maybe how people will actually pay me to do what I do. And I can help small business owners, not just really large companies. So it like opened my eyes of like what's actually possible. Um, so I hope I hope that makes sense, but I really wanted to like show you like finding out it was possible happened years before I quit my job. Oh, there's a lot to to dig in here. There's there's several things. One, I saw um, the belief system. So like mm -hmm. you said, your your wife, your or girlfriend or fiance at the time had said like, "Hey, you should do this," and you said after the third time, like you you need to do it, but but you didn't want to do it. Like you're not that you didn't want to do it. You maybe not believed you could do it. Was that the case? Uh, so whether it's, it's not really a function of like belief that I could do it. It was a function of belief of like, is this going to be worth it for me? Mm, okay. I had, I had almost like a belief of like, I'm too good for this. Like, like, like arrogance almost. And, you know, assuming small business owners like didn't have that kind of money. Um, yes. which is a I, very common belief. It's a very common belief that, but one businesses or small businesses don't have that kind of money. And two, they might not pay us. They might not pay me that money. Mm -hmm. Do you yeah. Maybe it was like a worth thing. Cause that like, you know, I tell you, I was not earning $22,000 in one hour worth of work at my corporate job. I'll tell you that. Right. Like maybe it was almost a belief of like, can I ask for this? You know, maybe I didn't even believe in that. Like when I asked this lady, uh, total told her the price. Like I said something that I thought was ridiculous. Is that because you didn't want to do it or just because you were just like, I'm going to be ridiculous about this? It's because I didn't want to do it. Okay. I like, I told her something that would force me to take, take it. Like if you've ever had a client where you're like, this is, this is my, like, you're going to have to force me to do this. I'm going to come out with a really high price. That was what I was doing in my head. So I could go back and tell my, my, um, you know, fiance, now wife, uh, Hey, actually I was right. This isn't worth my time. Mm. Uh, I was wrong. And if your wife tells you to do something, you should just turn off your brain and listen. <laughs> I like that. Uh, so let's, let's dive a little bit deeper. So you quit, you, uh, you didn't quit your job yet. You got your first no. client. So you yeah. got your first client, you're rolling. What happens next? So what ends up happening next is I end up taking on a couple clients over the next couple of years. Right. Okay. And I started to build like a little book of business. And one of them asks me to become their CFO. So I quit this big corporate job and I become a CFO of a middle market skincare company. Um, so, you know, there's still like, like a multi, you know, eight figure year business. Uh, they need a CFO. We're growing rapidly and I end up becoming um, their CFO. Got a couple clients on the side, whatever else. Um, and I do that for a year. 
and a couple of years have gone by. It's 2021 now, right? I've been doing fractional CFO for a little bit. I'm a full-time CFO now. I left the corporate job and I've got the smaller one. And I find that I hate working for the people that I'm working for. I am working 80 hours a week at least. I am in uh, Fort Lauderdale here is where I live. And I was flying to Atlanta every single week on a plane, spending the week there. So like 5 a.m. flight Monday morning, I fly up to Atlanta. 9 p.m. Uh, Friday night, I'm flying back to Fort Lauderdale. And I do it for a year. And I, I hate working for the people I'm working with. They're mean. They're nasty. I, um, I've got a, you know, a stomach ulcer from stress and a skin in like, like hives just from how stressed I am on mm-hmm. my hands. I've never had like skin issues or stomach issues before. And I realized like, I don't need this job. I don't need this money. Like I can actually earn more working for myself and being a fractional CFO than I can working for these people. And once I actually like realized and like looked at how much revenue I was bringing in, I was like, I should quit. And so I chose not to renew that contract. And like, I've been working for myself ever since then. Was there ever a moment where you were afraid? You're like, man, like, I want to quit these people. But like you said, they're nasty. Like, but there's like, what if I lose my clients? You know what I mean? What if I lose my clients? What if like, you know, there's things going on in 2020 happening again, COVID, things like that. Like, <laughs> what if all hell breaks loose? Like, was there ever, like ever that fear that was like, kind of like wanting to pull you and keep you safe, then, then go out and take that risk. Hmm. So I think, honestly, man, I was just so like, how do I put this? I was just so drained by it that like anything, anything you could imagine wouldn't be worse than continuing at the spot where I was at. Like, I I think I literally said to my wife, I was like, say I try this and it doesn't work out. Worst case, like we got to move in with my parents. Right. I was like, worst case, this is what happens. It's worst case. I'm fed. I'm loved. I'm protected. I'm safe. If we literally have to declare bankruptcy, which like we were nowhere near doing, you know, things would have to go wrong for a very long time for that to happen. And even if that happens, okay, cool. My wife and I have to live with my mom and dad and I feel discouraged and I'm embarrassed. But like, even that worst case scenario, I know I'm loved, I'm protected, I'm I'm fed, I've got a roof over my head. And that was a way better scenario than continuing working for the people I was working with. So. Mm. If my worst case scenario is I'm protected and I'm loved versus I'm being with people who, you know, are, are nasty and mean and, you know, calling my phone at 1130 PM on a Sunday for conference calls. That sounds like an upgrade. So if if my worst, if my worst case scenario is an upgrade, I can't go wrong. (laughs) So, yeah, I mean, I think some people are like, don't have their kind of like thought like that. Was I scared? Yeah. But if it didn't work out it was still a better situation than what I was going to be in because the spot I was in was just so bad. I just had to move out of it. And I'm grateful for the situation because it forced me to get into the situation I am today. And so I think about it like that, like they actually did me a favor, you know? And do, and do you see that with the, with the clients you work with? Like, do you see, do you see that like in them? Like, or like, uh, what's the best way to ask this question? Mm -hmm. Like, do you see that fear holding them back from taking that next step sometimes? Sometimes, yeah. So I, um, I recently brought on brought on um, a lady into our program, and like what we do is not only do we do fractional CFO work for companies now, but I also help accountants like make that shift and work for themselves and kind of grow that business. And there was a lady that joined us, and uh, two recently. One was about to quit her job, and she signed up with us. And I mean terrified. I think right when we were to sign up, she kind of started to cry. And I was like, Hey, like what, what's going on? She's like, well, like, I mean, word for word, I think she was like, what if this crap doesn't work? Mm-hmm. And I was like, okay, well, what if it doesn't like, what happens then? She's like, Oh, well, you know, I, I guess I have to go back and get a different job. Cause I hate this one. I was like, okay. So worst case scenario you're taken care of. I was like, what happens if this works? She's like, this is what I want to do. Like, this is, this is the, you know, like I make all this money and I have all this freedom and I get to spend time with my partner and all that. I was like, okay, well, there's your two parameters. There's worst case and there's best case. It's not going to be worst case, right? Like you're smart, you're capable. You've got all the tools. I've done it for me and a whole bunch of other people. So, you know, it's just, if you're ready to take the leap or not. 
and she was like, okay, all right. And then like we got her onboarded and in her first week, she got her first thousand dollar client. And, you know, even though it's like a little like smaller than we usually push people for her first week out, she got a new client. She's making money. Like that's awesome. You know what I mean? She's like that far to close in her life or, you know, to change in her life. And she also lives in a place where just one extra thousand dollars a month is, is massive. Mm -hmm. And so like, her worst, was, yeah, her worst place was literally back to where she would have started. Yeah. So yeah, a lot like, of people, there's not a lot of, there's not as much risk out there as people think, you know? And I mean, so, for some people there is, but like, if you're smart and you're talented, you can always find more work. So why not give, like, why not bet on yourself for once? That's powerful. And I think a lot of people need to do that. I think a lot more, a lot more people need to start taking more risks on themselves. Cause like you said, even in your situation, like your worst case scenario, you're going to live with your parents. I get to live with my parents who yeah. love me. Is it embarrassing being in my thirties and having to move back in with mom and dad? Sure. But it also didn't happen. But you were okay if it did. I mean, yeah. Like, like you wouldn't have been okay. I mean, you still would have had that drive. You still would have been pushing, but like you still would have been, been all right. Up. Okay is a different word. I would have <laughs> been all right. You would have been, yeah, you would have been. <laughs> uh, man, no. So, all right. So you, you, you got your, you, you, um, you kind of stumbled into your first account mm -hmm. then now you, you are, um, you also started working with another company. You got hired mm -hmm. on as, as CFO for them for a, skin, a skincare company. Yep. Was it, was it, was it just straight path from there? Or you're just like, just steady progress from there. Or was there any challenges that like, I, I'm kind of looking for like the biggest challenge that you've had to face, like during oh all God. this. The biggest, the biggest challenge. Um, what? Yeah, maybe what there was wasn't one. I'm just. No, I mean, there's a different challenge every week. <laughs> so oh, I heard that every new level, there's a new devil. I like that. That I'm all right. I'm going to have to make a mental note. Yeah, of that I've heard That's about that. I'm not sure if it was true. So I'm kind of seeing from like, from your perspective. It, it's funny. After you fix a challenge, it doesn't feel like a challenge anymore because you got a new problem to worry about. And so the old problem doesn't like come up. So I think, I think the first thing I was like, all right, well, how do I get new customers? Like that to me, um, was something new, right? Like I've, I've read like some marketing books, you know, I'm sure you've read all, all the same ones. Um, but I was like, how do I, how do I get new customers? Right. That was the first one is like, okay, I quit my job. Like I need to replace, you know, multi six figure year income. How do I do this? Um, so my first challenge was like getting new customers and I spent a lot of money. I learned a lot of things. Like I learned Facebook ads and I learned sales and I learned, you know, like going in groups and posting organic and I learned how to make reels and TikToks and all these other things. And so the first part was like, oh shoot, how do I get customers? Like, how do I replace this income? And so that was the first kind of challenge. Um, and if you even break that down, the first thing is like, how do I get people on the phone? Okay, once you yep. solve that, you learn Facebook ads, maybe build a funnel, you get really good at, you know, getting people to sign up uh, to book a call with you in a Facebook group, right? You know, maybe there's some LinkedIn, like I got good kind of at all those things, but then people get on the phone and I couldn't, I couldn't sell them. They needed my help. Mm. Like I couldn't, I couldn't get them to sign on. And so that next challenge was like, all right, now I have to get good at sales. Okay. Once I got good at, at marketing and I got good at sales. I needed to get good at like, how do I scale my fulfillment, right? Like, cool, I can sign on clients at whim, but realize like, if you're not good at fulfillment, cool, now you have no life. You earn a lot of money, but now you have no life. And so once you get good at fulfillment, then you have to get good at like hiring staff members and building a team. And like, that's where I am now. And so like each of those things is a massive problem. And when you work for yourself, you get really good at solving problems that like wouldn't traditionally be like air quotes, like your job. So what uh, run me through the process of, of your, of your, of your problem solving. I'm kind of curious about that. Like how I solve problems in general. Yeah. Like you're like, you're thinking, cause I think like me, I started playing chess a lot. So mm -hmm. I think that life is like, you can relate to chess and life a lot. So it's like, um, are you familiar with the concepts of chess, which is like a little bit blunders Well, blunder basically means you just made a, you just like put your queen out there and someone could take it right away. 
And oh, then like, okay. like a good move means like, yo, I just made a very good move. So like, so when it comes to problem solving, we can make a blunder. You know what I mean? We could just be like, okay, let's just make the worst impulsive emotional decision possible. Or we can really think about it and be like, okay, hey, I can maybe sacrifice this and make a good move. So like I'm just kind of curious like how you how you do like your mm. how you problem solve you know what I mean because it's like um, at a higher level you're you're definitely you got to that higher level so you definitely have a way of problem solving that gets you to that next level versus uh, okay. someone who just like gets a problem and they're like man I can't accomplish this and then just kind of like the problem imp- overcome like the problem solves them. <laughs> <laughs> like, okay I, I totally totally get it so i um corporate finance background i think in kind of like decision trees or processes or steps and so if i had a, a whiteboard which i do behind me i would kind of break this out for you but i think about it like this if i break everything down into smaller problems things get really easy and so Let's think of a fractional CFO business. It's a service-based business. It very works very similarly to like an advertising agency or even like, you know, a service-based business like a painter. Like you have uh, a service that you sell. There's an amount you charge and there's a certain amount of hours and not so much of materials, but hours and labor that get applied to it. Yep. So if I own a service-based business, I got to think about like what levers do I need to pull to change that? And so my thought is, is like, all right, if I need, in the beginning, my first problem was like, I, I need to get more customers. I need more money. Mm-hmm. So my first problem is sales. So in order to get a new customer, like what, what happens, like say someone signs up and I, I charge their card on Stripe, boom, I'm getting paid. Like what happens right before that? The right. sales call. Yeah. yeah usually, right. right? Yeah. And what happens right before the sales call? Uh, right before the sales call, you have to book the meetings. Okay. And what happens before that? Right before booking the meeting, you have to start doing outreach. Okay. And then what happens before that? You have to know who you're going to outreach to. And then before that is you got to know what you're going to say. Yes. So I like to reverse engineer where I want to go. So um, if I want to sign on, you know, uh, 10 clients at $5,000 a month. That's cool. That's $50,000 a month. How do I do that? Well, that means I probably need to take more than 10 sales calls. Okay. So how many sales calls do I need to take? Let's assume, you know, I was like, all right, so how many sales calls do I need to take? Maybe like two out of every 10 people are willing to buy from me. Okay. So that means that I need to have 50 sales calls to sign up, you know, 10 people to turn them into 10 clients. Cool. So I need to have 50 sales calls. All right. How the hell do I get 50 sales calls? Right. And so my my thought before that was like, all right, well, I will find like where to go. And so for me, Facebook group is how I found my first client. I was like, all right, let me, let me see how, if I can find other clients this way. So I started posting Facebook groups you know, interacting, doing value posts, you know, seeing if I could solve people's problems, you know, uh, putting lead magnets out there, all those things. And I started interacting with people and I was like, okay, well, in order to get 50 people on the phone, how many people do I need to interact with? Okay. And out of those, you know, how many people do I need to interact with? Is that how many groups do I need to post in? How many posts do I need to make? And so I just tried to reverse engineer each of those things. And so if you spend 10 minutes thinking about that, or any problem, I just reverse engineer, like, how do I get to the solution that I want? And so for me, it was like, all right, if I need to have 50 conversations um, over a period of time, I probably need to make this many number of posts, um, this style, this number of place, or maybe spend this much money on Facebook ads, or this number of LinkedIn DMs, or this number of like Instagram reels, like whatever it was, I had to reverse engineer, like the leading indicators or the drivers to the thing that I'm trying to get. And so any problem I have, I just reverse engineer it and then just work on those steps like one thing at a time. And if I do that, everything's easy because it's one thing at a time. Got it. Okay. So versus focusing on like the problem, you're, you're kind of going backwards and going to the next, the problem that's actually before that, that would probably solve that problem. Right. And and if if you can solve things one at a time, things are really easy. 
if I tell you to go make a million dollars tomorrow, you're going to be like, but how? Okay, Sounds well, easy. <laughs> yeah. It's like, all right, cool. I did it. But if you, you break into those little buckets and those little levers to pull, well, then things get a lot easier and you can kind of get a plan and your dreams can become a reality. But if I just tell you, you know, Marcos, go be a millionaire tomorrow. You're like, um, excuse me, what? Like how? And so I like to focus on the how. Um, and then you can, you know, you can make things happen that way. So that's like how I look at every problem. Interesting. Well, if you want to make $50,000 as a fractional CFO, you can follow this formula. No, I'm kidding. I mean, yeah, I'm actually. Kidding. Yeah. yeah. I mean, but, like what yeah. the exercise just did is what, what we do in our program, like giving away the sauce. It's not, it's not magic. We just yeah. hold your hand while you do it. Where, uh, where can they find your program? Like, is, is that, are you using school? Like with, uh, Sam ovens? Uh, so we use school, but okay. the best way to find our program is look up a uh, profit surge group on Instagram or go to profit surge group.com slash call. Those are probably the best ways to get a hold of me. You can find me on Instagram and ask me some questions that that also works. So you said that's exactly what you just, what you just ran me through is what you're teaching in your program for, uh, accountants, yep. accountants. Yes. Yeah. I mean, that's one out of like 50 yeah. things. I know that's but... not all of it. You... <laughs> <laughs> That'll be $10,000. Yeah, um... yeah, just, just, just watch this podcast. We're going to have to charge you. There's going to be a fee right before it. <laughs> um, that's one of the mindset things that we go over. Okay. And when you look over that, that's how like real this can be. And then, so we come up with a game plan. How do you get those appointments? How do you sell those people? What do you charge them for? What's the place, best place to get there? How do you get messaging that gets buyers instead of broke people, right? So there's a lot more that goes into it, but that mentality of reverse engineering things is exactly what we teach people. And then we give them what to do on each little step. And what's the most common objection you're getting with uh, people who are ready to sign up? They're like, yo, I want to do this. I want to take my life to the next level. I want to be a... Uh, I want to make more money. You know what I mean? I want to quit my mm -hmm. job. I want to go to the next level. Like you're the guy. I know you're the guy. Like I know you can make, you can take me there, but what's the most common objection that's stopping them? <sighs> Uncertainty. So like they believe that it works, but there's just something there that they usually think like they won't, it won't work for them. Like, Maybe it worked for you, Charles, and maybe you're special. And maybe it worked for everyone else in your program, but maybe they're special. You know, maybe they had a different background, right? Like, so there's the belief of like, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not strong enough. Somebody's different than me is one belief. And the other one is, is like, okay, you showed me the general path, but I need to figure out exactly how on everything else. But if you knew exactly how, you'd already be there. Mm -hmm. um, so uncertainty is a big one. Um, from a money perspective, like the ROI is there. Uh, we, we never get like that complaint. Um, it's mostly just like fear holding people back, you know, and that's the hard part. Like sometimes people are afraid of investing themselves and making a decision to like move forward. But if you never do that, you're never going to leave where you're at. And like some people aren't meant to work for themselves and that's okay. But if you think about quitting and working for yourself all the time, it's the only thing you think about, but the only thing holding you back is fear. Well, like callously and almost, yeah, I mean, this, this hurts to say, but like, it's your fault of like why you're not where you want to be. And if you keep making the same decisions, you're going to get the same results. Um, and so sometimes people are just afraid to do something different. And that's, that's the thing I have the biggest empathy for because I was forced into this situation and I got lucky of like, my wife was like, Hey, maybe you should do this. Maybe it'll work they didn't have that. And then I was forced to like leave that job for like my, you know, emotional and mental, like physical health. Most people don't have that force. That's like going to push them over the fear. And so that's why I find a lot of people hold themselves back in almost anything. And, you know, I just, I wish I could find a way to help those individuals get over that fear. Damn, no, that, have, have you ever been to church and the pastor says a message and it speaks directly to you? That's literally how that was like to me. I felt every, like, I felt that in my soul. I literally felt that in my soul. I'm just like, man, like, dude's, he's literally calling me out. I mean, look, you're doing the thing. You're, yeah. you're creating the podcast. You're getting in front of people. 
You know, like I know, what did we speak for like an hour and a half last time we were on the phone? Yes. We um, did. you know, you're, you're getting over that fear. I think when we first talked, you're like, I just need to take action. <laughs> I action. think you said that like action. five times on that call. Yeah, just action, 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 action. Because I know the fear <laughs> fear is the opposite of action. So if I'm in fear, I'm not taking action. And and I think like like you're saying, like if, if you're afraid and you're and you know you should do what like you need to do what you're you know you need to do that fear is stopping you from doing. Mm-hmm. And just and go with it because the worst, literally, honestly, you were overthinking it, and the worst, the worst that's gonna happen, you're gonna wind back and maybe have to stay with a relative. You might, you're not gonna be homeless. Like it's, it's all, it's all in our head. Yeah, I, you know, and and some people they might even be homeless, but like, is the worst thing always gonna happen every time? You know, like have some trust in yourself. Like give it a shot. You know. And like fall maybe back this... onto another job, the worst, like, because if you're a hardworking person, you can get another job anywhere. If you're really smart and talented, and you have a network, uh, you maybe it's not your dream job, but you can get a job. That's like, what I'm saying. I... So worst case scenario, you get a job again, and then you're back to not square one because you made some progress. So you're just back to like working a job, but with progress that you made with the months that you that you quit and and actually tried this thing. Yeah. And like, we haven't had anyone who's quit their job and joined our program and had to get another job. How, how important is all in like for, for the people you're working with? Like how, how important is that? Uh, I mean, man, that's like, what's the, what's the phrase? Like burn the boats. Like if you're, if you're gonna, what what are you, if you're like a a Scandinavian Viking, right. You're going to go invade, you know, the United Kingdom, like, like, or, or, you know, I guess, I guess it was England at the time. Um, like burn the boat behind you. Like, like you stepped off the uh, off into the land, like, and you're invading. Like, burn the boat behind you. You have no other options. Like, you can't not succeed. Like, if you've overcome all these other things in your life, and you're gonna force yourself to succeed, like, you'll get there. You'll do it. We just guarantee that you'll get there a hell of a lot faster than you would on your own. Um, and we give you all the tools. But like, all in is all in is massive. Like, if you put in half the effort, you're gonna get half the results. Well. You know, a lot of people aren't okay with half half the results. So, like, don't put in half the effort. Put in all the effort to get all the results. And I found with effort, it kind of works like this. Like, if you do a half-assed effort, you don't really get any results. But if you do 100% effort, you get 100% of the results. Mm. So, like, I just encourage people, whether they're trying to start their own fractional CFO firm or, you know, or start their own podcast like you, like, don't do anything halfway. If you do it all the way, you're going to get big big results. If you were halfway, like you're just wasting your time, like go do something else, go get a job, like whatever, you know what I mean? So I would recommend like, do it, do it all the way. My business didn't really start to grow until I was forced to go all in. And so if you can manufacture that feeling for you, like that's massive. That is, that is so massive. Powerful. No, that's powerful. Cause uh, there's several people I follow like Sam ovens. You're, you are, you know, who Sam ovens is mm-hmm. you're on school. He goes all in on everything he does. It's scary. Yeah, I know. He quit like a multi-million dollar business to go all in on school. So it's like, you don't think he was scared at that level? Like, who wants to just throw, like, get rid of millions and millions of dollars? Like, there's there's fear at every level. Uh, with that being said, uh, I got a question for you. Do you think life's a game? Um, I mean, yes and no. When people say life is a game. So, like... And you have to build your character to get um, to that next level. Oh gosh. So like in, in a way, like it is because there's always like things that you can learn or things that you can do or whatever else um, that you could like play with. But at like the same point, we're only here so long. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't call it a game. Like life is serious. Like you only have so much time on this planet. Like, I don't know if I'm going to wake up tomorrow. Hmm. And so is it a game? Is it a function of like, I have inputs and I'm looking for different outputs and I want to see what happens and this is cool and there's no rules and I can experiment with whatever I want. And that function, yeah, life is a game. But if it's a game, do you not treat it seriously? I don't know. I mean, my days are packed from eight to eight because I have goals and I have places I want to be. 
Um, and I like want to spend time with my family. So like, I have like everything set. Um, I don't, yeah, no, I mean, I think I have to disagree. Like, like I don't treat life as a game. It's serious, but I'm serious about my goals. Um, so I like think business is a game. Yeah. But life, like I'm, I'm only got so much time on this planet and I want to get the most out of it possible. Um, and for the longest time, like I didn't chase my dreams cause I just stayed at the corporate job and like, I wish, I wish I quit earlier, you know, knowing what I know now. Damn. Okay. Uh, different perspectives. Some people think life's a game. And when they say game, they're thinking like leveling up as a character, your character. To oh, the yeah, yeah. So, I was thinking like the flippancy of like, yeah, no, 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 no. I, I know what you mean. Like life. I like, I like the fact you take life seriously, which is that is that, I mean, you just showed right there how you, much you care. You know what I mean? Like you're not just like, yeah, you look, I'm all in. I'm serious about this. This is no game to me. But what I'm saying is like leveling up your character, getting to that next level. Would you consider like that, like a game in the fact that like you can't get to that next level unless you beat level one? Oh, yeah. I mean, I heard something. Someone told me this. I, I forget how it goes, but like life's kind of like a circle and, and each like hardship you have, the circle gets a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger and things don't bother you as much. And so like, for example, like I solved the sales problem. Like selling new clients, not hard, totally fine. And so like my circle has expanded, you know, okay. um, I have that skill set. I have the ability, I have the emotional intelligence to kind of operate through that. And so if it's a game as a function of like, I'm getting to another level, I'm unlocking new character points and new skill points. And you know, when you, whatever you get to the end of the video game, you're like an overpowered character and you can kind of one hit everything. Yeah, I believe that. But like, you got to put in the effort and time to like sharpen those skills and there's just like levels of of getting better so i I, like there's plenty of people who are at a levels past me and i'm like all right what do i have to do what are they doing how do i get there what books are they reading who are they talking to you know what things are they doing um so i think about it like that way um like that makes sense as, as, as a function as a game to me like there's always like another like thing i can progress to is there ever a point where you're like, okay, I'm I'm done progressing? You think there will be that point where you think you're just all like, no matter what, you're like, I mean, when I'm, I'm gonna, dead, sure. I have to keep going. Like, I have to keep pro- progressing. I mean, I I'm like a very curious guy, so I always want to learn and I always want to grow. I don't think you're ever really done. I think when you're done, it's kind of when you're dead. You know, your your brain's a muscle, right? If you don't use it, you lose it. So I, I hope I never think I've arrived. Like I want to be teachable for the rest of forever. Cause like, dude, I don't, I don't know everything. I'm like that's totally fine. All right. So we, we, we're, we've, uh, you, you were, we're at the point now where you, we talked about, you had your, your first client, then you, you moved on and, and your next phase. Mm-hmm. What was life like? I'm kind of curious. What was life like before that? Like let's let's kind of go backwards now. Mm-hmm. Like prior to that first client, let's maybe even say college. Maybe even say like just further back. Like I want to. I'm kind of curious. Like what like like what even got you into what you're passionate about in the first place? You know what I mean? Like how did like your journey like okay like, yeah, oh, yeah, where yeah. you are now? Like because like you wouldn't be where you are now if you didn't learn the skill. Like for the most part. Yeah. So I'm not saying you wouldn't because okay, so that's actually uh, rude for me to say, but like, I'm not saying you wouldn't be where you are now. I'm just I saying you're doing something different. You that's would be doing sure. something different. Correct. Yeah. Hopefully I would be doing just as well as that as I am here, but who knows? Um, so I've always been like a really curious kid. Like I was one of those kids who got in trouble for reading, you know, in school about a different topic. Like I've always trying to like learn. And, um, you know, I went, I went to school and I, I graduated from university of Florida and there's something about finance that I loved um, that got me really into it. And it fits with my, my natural curiosity and my ability for like conceptual thinking. Um, so in finance, there's, there's only really two rules and is like, is it possible? And like, will people buy it outside of like, is it, is it legal? Is it moral? Like, like th- those are a baseline of character or we're just assuming that it's there. Um, but in the, in the realm of finance, like, is it legal? Um, and, and is it possible? And will someone buy it? And so like anything you want to create, you can, um, because 
finance is the study of time and money and how they relate to each other. And to me, that just seems like esoteric. Like I love um, the conceptual thinking around that. And so that's what drew me to that. And so my wife will tell you, like during college, I would read so many finance textbooks that were not like uh, prescribed as part of the courses. And I would, I would, I remember sitting on the beach with her in like 2015 or whatever, and just explaining um, some like financial concept that I, I learned. I think, I think this was after school. Um, and just like her just listening to me, like just nerd out. And she, I remember just being like, I love you. I'm, I'm, I'm so, I'm so glad you find these things interesting. And like, I'm so grateful she'll listen to me talk about stuff like that. But like, that's, that's me in a nutshell. I want to learn everything and I'll just go on a random something I learned <laughs> in some book. Um, so I think like the thing that's driven me to there is really just like my natural born like curiosity. Like I just want to know all the things. Because finances aren't sexy. You know what I mean? It's not, it's not that sexy thing that you're like, everyone no. wants to talk about. And honestly, it's the most like, one, they don't teach it enough in school. So you no, get out of right. school and you literally just have no clue what to do with your finances. Uh, I'm speaking me, for example, like I got out of school and I just literally blew all my money, like every penny. And I, I even bought a truck. Like th I think the first, here, here's how my, like I, uh -oh. like I, um, if I could go back now, I would make better decisions. But like, had I known, like, even just like the basics of like finances and money, I would have made, I think I would have made smarter decisions. So like I got my first job. Now I got a truck. Now I'm in debt. Mm -hmm. And I, um, what else did I do? I don't know. I, was just, I think I was going out to the clubs and stuff like that. So I was like, yeah, you're just not spending your money correctly. And what, like, what, what would you say for, for just like the people out there who maybe they're just out of school or maybe they're just, they're, they're already working their jobs and they're just, they have no clue about finances. Like what, like how serious do they need to take this? And like, what, what advice can you give them that can like, help them, help them like just make better decisions. Okay. Um, so I think about it like this, right? Like there's like the whole Dave Ramsey school of thought, like don't borrow money or whatever. I'm, I'm not in that, um, in that camp. Um, to me, something that I learned is it's, you can't cut your expenses below zero, right? Like there's only so many lattes you can not drink in a day to save money. My only thought is, is how do I make more money? Mm. And so like, Technically, I can make infinite amount of money. However, I can only save up to 100% of what my living expenses are, right? So like outside of like mortgage and food, like if I don't decide to eat out or do anything fun, like that's all the most money I could save. Maybe that's a couple hundred bucks a month. Or I could just go out and earn more. And I came up with like a theory about earning more and it's simply how do I create as much value as possible for somebody else? and capture as much of that as possible for me. If you align those two things, whether you're in business or whether you're working for a large company, you can earn more as long as you focus on creating more and then capturing some of that for yourself. Your your money problems always going to be solved. So instead of um so instead of uh focusing on how to save like the last penny, how to mm -hmm. not drink less lattes, yeah. Uh, for instance, me, I even like, you can't see it right here, but I normally have my scooter parked there. Cause I literally cut my car expenses out and got a scooter. So I would save money. You know what I mean? So I yeah. could save money and go to the next level. But you, you would say it's more important to figure out how to create value and how to increase your, your income versus say like save, right. your, save your income. No, I'm not saying like, Hey, make minimum wage and, you know, go out and buy a, a Ford Raptor. Right or go out and buy a McLaren. I'm not saying that. Yeah, yeah, I'm correct. Saying, no, I'm I'm with you on that. Yeah, <laughs> but like, if you have a hundred dollars a month in discretionary fund budget, or even if it's a thousand dollars a month, like, is that going to change your life, or is making an extra th five thousand dollars a month going to change your life? That would. Cool, and then you can have all the lattes you want. <laughs> uh, so like that's that's my kind of goal. Um, probably the opposite of what finance people tell you, but like. I have an abundance mindset. I don't have a scarcity mindset. So like if I want something nice, I just go out there and get it. You know, I might have to sell some more stuff to get there. That's totally fine. Your abundance mindset. I've heard multiple people talk about that. I'm, I'm working on it. I'm working okay. on getting there. I know I'm, I'm going to be honest. I have a scarcity mindset. Like I still have the scarcity mindset that I'm working on overcoming and getting rid of. I don't think it just goes away overnight. Uh, I could be wrong. 
But uh, let, let walk me through a scenario of an abundance mindset. How I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a problem of maybe I'm gonna give you a a situation of a recent problem I'm facing. Mm -hmm. Can you kind of tell me what your mindset would be on this problem? Okay, it let's go. It'd be cool to kind of see like like a scarce like me. I'm gonna agree. I have a scarcity mindset, and then you have an abundance mindset. So I loaned my brother money. Mm -hmm. And I think this is, is common common for anyone out there. They loan a relative money. They loan a friend money and they don't pay you back. Mm. You know what I mean? It's like they, they don't pay you back. They're, they go ghost. They go ghost on you. And I even made a Facebook post about this. I have uh, I've started adding new people to my network and I was literally mm -hmm. getting called out like left and right. They're like, why are you worried about $500? Boom, 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 boom. Like, Probably, I get but, it. Okay. Yeah. So. How how are like with an abundance mindset? How are you how are you um, thinking about that situation? Because that it it's kind of gotten between our relationship as for me and my brother. Because like I'm not like a super rich guy. Like I'm gonna be honest, I'm not super rich. I, like five hundred dollars right. means a lot to me right now. Right, and and one day maybe five thousand dollars means nothing to you. Um, I think of it like this, especially with family. I've got one family, man. That's it. Does money really matter? And so if you're going to be lending money to family, just assume it's a gift. That's it. Just assume it's a gift. Assume you'll never get it back. And if that's the case and like, that's totally fine. Now I'm not saying like be abused financially by your family members and you know, you always have to like have your own boundaries. But for me, Anything that could stand in the way of me and my family member, if it's money, I'm not going to let that bother me. Now, would I lend him money again? Probably not. <laughs> but would I assume the first $500 is a donation to your to your, your brother's uh, fund for whatever he's doing with it? I would also assume that and then just never lend him money again. But if you're ever going to do that forward, you know, just assume it's a gift. Like that's that's what I would do. But. I don't want to get super into this, but I have a brother and he's no longer here. So if I could pay $500 to bring him back, like I would pay $5 million to do so. So when you're asked, like, should that get in the way? My answer is like, no, <laughs> just don't lend him money ever again. And assume that you, you learned a $500 lesson, which is don't lend him money. Just give him money. <laughs> Fair enough. And I think that, I think that could like, if you give it to him, you're not going to be thinking about it no more. It's not going to be on your mind. It's yeah. like, it's gone. But if you, if you have that, like, I want my money back mentality. It's, it's just like, going to ruin your day. You're going to be thinking about it all the time. And like, man, that's your brother, you know, like, uh, don't, don't, don't have that feeling anymore. You learned a lesson, you know, and maybe, maybe it's like enough to where you like, it stings a little bit now, but in the future it won't. And like, maybe that's just a good motivation for you to go out and earn some more money. Not to say he doesn't owe you money anymore, but maybe that's some good motivation to like, you know, build out your offer all the way you want to and, and something like that, you know? So that's, that's my own personal thoughts. I think everyone has their, their own, um, that, that subject's just like kind of touchy to me and in individual, but man, I, I really appreciated you having me on today and like being here. It's been really cool to like dive into everything that we've talked about. I just want to let you know, like definitely appreciate the the conversation we've had today and the, the other day. No, same here. I've, I've enjoyed every moment of it. Uh, are we done? Are you? Yeah, I got. I got to jump. Okay. Okay. Fair enough. Yeah, I um, dude, really, really appreciate having you on. I didn't realize I scheduled something back to back, um, with this. So I would love to love to keep keep going. Um, but I I didn't, I didn't realize we kind of jumped in this kind of slow. Um, would love to talk about kind of some more more stuff. But this has been this has been really cool. You're you ask really good questions, man. Appreciate it. Thank you. You asked really good questions. Like, obviously, I can tell you put a lot of work into this for sure. We're back. Charles, welcome. Hey. Round two. Round two. Love it. Glad I'm here. Round two. Uh, appreciate you coming back on. I know, like you said, you had a short notice. Not, not short notice, but you had things you had to do yesterday. So appreciate you coming back on. Like, coming back on. Uh, depends on how the this how long this episode is. We might clip it up in two, two versions. So we'll kind of just uh, gauge with that. Um, but, uh, what I'm, what I meant to ask you yesterday. So I, I started a new ritual and I wanted to do this at, um, which was Wednesday, not yesterday, mm -hmm. 
I have a, a new ritual I wanted to do, which was I was going to ask a guest at the end of each show to ask a question for the next guest. And I got this from another podcast and I thought it was really cool. But since uh, you had to jump off early, I switched the ritual up to start to ask this at the beginning, because I think if I ask it at the beginning, I won't one, I won't forget because I'm known <laughs> to forget things. But uh, two, just uh, biggest thing is won't forget. So um, our last guest had a question for you. Okay. And, but before I ask you that question, I want you to think of a question without knowing who the next guest is. A question you would like to ask them. Oh, gosh. Um, okay, I've got one. Do you want me to tell it to you? Yes. All right. What's What's the book that has changed your life the most? The book that's changed your life, life the most. Got yeah, it. And, okay. and why? I want to know the story, of course. The story on what changed your like, uh Yeah, like, like, like what book changed your life the most and like why did it change your life? Like what did it do? You know what I mean? Got it. Okay, perfect. Yeah. And, all right. So our, the question for you is, if you could wave a magic wand and solve the most pressing problem in your life right now, what would that be? Oh, the most pressing problem in my life? Oh, gosh. Um, well, that's pretty good. Uh, what's the biggest problem in my life right now? If I could just solve it, it'd be instantly fixed. Um, right now, I'm like hiring a lot of people. Okay. And that's great. But the thing is, is when you hire someone, it takes a lot of time. And then so you're thinking, oh, I'm going to hire all these people and things are going to get so much better, right? Because uh, they can do the thing and I can't do the thing. Which, which you don't realize is when you hire someone, your life gets way more complicated because not only do you have to do the thing, you have to train people to do the thing at the same time. And you have to get good at like making sure what's in your brain goes over to their brain. And so I am in a phase where I'm like hiring a bunch of people and like putting it over to them. And it's taking way more time than I thought. Usually like I have a good like work life balance. And right now I don't mm. um, simply, simply because that's something like I'm, I'm solving right now. And that's like kind of the next level because I own, own the two businesses here. And one of them, I haven't had people like, it's like employees is kind of new. And the other one I've been had employees for, for a while. And so if I could just fix that, I would buy so much of my time back. Um, and that was the point, but I'm actually negative time right now. So that's like the most pressing thing to me today where it's like, boom, if I could have these guys trained up and ready to go and, and perfect, that would be like the biggest fix for me right now in my business, like finance and sales and marketing, like all that other stuff's good, but it's just getting the new people on and getting them fully trained and ready to go. So like, if I had to think of something, that's that's probably the biggest thing for like today. And I have a question for you on that. So mm -hmm. on on hiring employees, if you hired an employee, like just say you hired someone, right? And you had them do a like a specific role, just say for instance, sales role, mm -hmm. and they weren't able to to fulfill that role. You know what I mean? They weren't able to fulfill the the duty, they weren't able to get clients. I'm curious, who's who's uh who's at fault there? Is it the business owner or is it the employee? Um, usually, so first of all, like if I hire someone, usually I've asked them like a ton of questions. I think it's a good character fit. Um, I think like you can't teach character, but you can teach technicals. Mm, okay. So I can't teach hard work. I can't teach, on teach honesty. I can't teach, you know, like respect, kindness. I can't teach curiosity. I can't teach like things that are the core of your being. Okay. I can teach technicals. So if somebody's not performing. It's usually my fault. So I'm always like, all right, what information did I not give them? Did I not give them enough training? Was I not clear enough? Did I not set better, enough, good enough expectations? Did I didn't give them the right tools? So now I don't really understand it from their perspective. Like if I'm the business owner, everything is my fault always. Because if it's not my fault, I can't fix it. If it is my fault, well, then I have control over it. Therefore, I can fix it. And so nine times out of 10 is the business owner's fault, not the employee's fault. Okay. And so after you've crossed off all nine of those things that you can do better, then maybe it's an issue of, is the employee really the best fit for this? And again, if they're not, well, you hired them. It's also still your fault. I like that mindset. Take responsibility. Cause I've hired a few people in the past. It was just kind of like VAs and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But I was always like, oh yeah, they, they didn't do their job, but I've been coming more like realizing that like, if they didn't, 
weren't successful, it had to do with me not teaching them well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're you're smart to to realize that because it's it's easy to like point the finger and be like you didn't do this thing. Yeah, maybe they didn't. Did they know? Did they understand? Um, did do they have all the tools? Did they have the bandwidth? Like, do they have all these things set? Now, if they do have all those things and they just aren't doing it, you know, do they have like issues at home? Like, like usually when something's happened, I'm like, hey, like, what's what's going on? Like, is everything good at home? Is like every everything good here? Like, what's what's an issue? Because I usually just assume that people's character is good because we have a pretty good like filter for that. And so if you're not meeting your performance, it's either I've done a bad job or like something's happened to you in your personal life. And like, maybe I got to give you some more support to help you get through that in the long term, whether it's, you know, time off or additional benefits or comp or help or whatever it may be. Um, you know, I want to see people succeed and I, I like to keep people for the long term. And that involves like actually caring about them as a person. They're not just like an employee, like they're part of your team, you know? Yeah, that makes sense. That makes yeah. a lot, honestly, that makes a lot of sense. So we we left off on the podcast. I was asking you a question on on um, one percenters. It, the The question was more along the lines of like, how do one percenters think? Um, and I was thinking just the other day, I was like, how like what's the biggest thing like it takes to be a one percenter? Like, what is that thing that where it really takes to like if you have this, like you have a chance of being a one percenter? So. What do you mean specifically by one percenter? One percenter means like you are like no matter what you're gonna rise up to the next level. Like you are you don't you're not gonna stay like living an average lifestyle. You're gonna you're gonna rise up. You're going to go to that next level. And if you had this like, I'm not saying it's only one skill or one mindset that's gonna get you there, but if you had this, you have a better chance of of rising up. Mm, okay. All right. So what's like? What's like the number one thing that is going to allow you to kind of like get to that next level? Kind of back to your like game question. Correct. Um, hmm. What's like the number one thing? Uh, man, there there are so many different things. Um, so I like so many things come to mind when I think of this. And out of all the people I've coached, out of all the clients I've had who've been successful, out of the you know the people who have like I've done their their books for versus like I've helped grow their business or whatever. The number one thing that determines whether you're successful or not is is mostly your mindset. And it it sounds it sounds crazy, but I can get on the phone with someone and in 10 minutes I can I I can understand why they're not where they want to be in their life. Mm. They have a negative attitude, this won't work for me, I'm not smart enough, I'm not good enough, I'm not special enough, I don't, you know, deserve money, you know, that like someone else had it easier than me, right? Like once you clear all that stuff away, it just work. Right. And so like anybody can work, like, you know, sit your butt in a chair and get on the computer or, you know, get out and create or whatever you're doing. And anybody can do that. But like, what's stopping you from putting in that time? What's stopping you putting in that effort? You know, if something bad happens to you, like, do you go, Oh no, what was me? Or do you go, okay, well next, like, I'm just gonna look at the next opportunity. And so the biggest thing that I see that hold people back is having the wrong mindset. And so the people that I see as successful, is they have the right way to think about things, which is there's an, it's an abundance mindset. There's going to be another opportunity. If I mess up, congratulations, I got to learn. You know, and sometimes those lessons are really expensive and that's okay. But if I can do better tomorrow than I did today, and it's only based upon if I want to do better for myself and not like competing against other people, I'm going to improve every single day. I've made massive mistakes. I've lost a ton of money and I've also like made massive wins and made a ton of money. But like of those mistakes that I just stopped and was like, oh, I guess working for myself isn't for me. I was like, well, shit, this didn't work. <laughs> okay, fine. Let me try something new like next and just wake up the next day. So having the right mindset, you're a lot more curious. You know, you don't know everything. Um, you're willing to work a hell of a lot harder. Um, and you like treat people with respect and have this thing called emotional intelligence. So I understand mindset is really like a catch all answer, but just how you think about things is the biggest determinant that I've ever seen for anyone ever. You know, there's a reason why people rise to the top and sometimes it's luck, but usually they got something else going on there. It's usually how they think. So, uh, the mindset, everyone is born in different environments, right? I think their environment can also affect your mindset too. what the type Huge. of environment you're, you're in the 
family you're born from, how your mm -hmm. parents, their, their traumas are going to be brought onto you. So now you have generational trauma. Um, what does it really take to like, to catch and, tr and uh, change? Because like most people might not feel like they have a problem. And I think that's where it starts is like, they don't feel like they have a bad mindset. Uh, well, I mean, Let's let's do a diagnosis. Let's see if you have if like people do have a bad mindset. Let's, I'm ready. Let's, no, let's diagnose let's that. Right? When something bad happens to you, what do you do? When something bad happens to me, I let's see what do I do? Mm -mm -mm. Can like think of it, like give me a bad example, like something like like. Okay, say you go and we you know you film five podcasts this week, and then you go to your computer and you find out your hard drive is like fried all the podcasts delete, Damn, gone i'm gonna be, I'm gonna be ups, very upset <laughs> i'm like fuck because i'm like one i just didn't like we did our interview and i'm feel like I, I feel like i let you down <laughs> i'm like i just let everybody down i wasted all their time like this is bad okay so that's that's there what are you gonna do after that uh what am i gonna do after that i uh, hope to message you and say man like i hate to say this but i just lost all of our one hour of a footage sorry yeah but like are you, are you gonna try again or are you just be like oh, i guess podcasting is not for me in the past i would quit i uh, my last podcast that i did whenever i first started podcasting in 2017 mm -hmm. i went to the next shiny object syndrome but I, okay. I have more of a mindset now to where i'm like sticking to this and and going full force okay so like you know, to use your vernacular, somebody who's a, a, a in the top one percent of performance, results, mindset, income, whatever, whatever, like the top one percent uh, is um, for you, like that person is going to be. Well, damn, that sucks. All right, um, can I fix it? Can I go send it to somewhere to get it changed? Uh, you know, can I like get the hard drive restored, repaired? No, okay, can't do that. All right, well. Sh you know, I'm going to communicate effectively to everyone. Hey, these are the, this is the problem. This is what happened. I'm really sorry. I would love to shoot with you again. If you, you have me, if cool, if not, like I understand you're going to do that. And then you're going to wake up the next day and you go, all right, well, I'm going to keep going. And it's, it's not going to stop you. Right. You're just going to, you're just going to shrug it off. Um, I read this book. I forgot the title of it, but it was a chapter called the theory of next. So anytime if something really bad's happened to you, you just think next, like, okay, what's next? Like, I'll try it again. There's always going to be another deal. There's going to be another podcast. And so, like, when bad things happen, are you letting it get you down? Are you blaming it on other people? Like, you know, you mentioned your brother yesterday. Like, what if he drops your laptop and he dropped it in a puddle, right? And, like, maybe that ruined it. Are you going to be mad at him? Yeah, a little bit, of course. You'd be like, dude, dude, it's my laptop. What's going on? But, like, okay, the next day, are you still going to be mad at him or are you going to get to filming again? Mm, okay so like just 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 get back to work that stuff happens all the time and so what that makes sense no i've been honestly i've been trying to develop a mindset like muhammad ali like i look up to him and like the way he i feel like the way he like I, like at the, in the beginning i really didn't recognize it i was just like okay muhammad ali he just like fucking has all these chance i thought they were like chance like oh yeah like i'm the greatest Float mm -hmm. like a butterfly, sting like a bee. But like, there are really things that he would say. I'm not sure where he got it from. I wish I knew, but mm -hmm. um, he has it, and I feel like that propelled him to 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 be the best and go to the next level. Because without that mindset, he most likely wouldn't have won as many fights as he did. Yeah, I mean, uh, what's what's the quote from uh, Mike Tyson? Everybody's got a plan until they get punched in the face. Yeah, no, and I've been punched in the <laughs> face, and it's not fun. <laughs> Uh, same. It sucks. I really don't enjoy it. <laughs> I prefer, I would prefer to not dodge. to happen again. I prefer to uh, dodge them. So you were probably better dodging than me. Maybe, maybe before in the past, I, I at least trained a little bit, but now I'm just like, nah, I will see. There we go. I'm gonna say I'm not as fast, but I am fast. <laughs> okay. There, there, there we go. There I am we go. fast. I'm, <laughs> I'll be real. I'm good at getting the, I'm good at getting hit. <laughs> Is there something you did to to improve your mindset? Was there like a like a book you read, a course you take took taken, a mentor you looked up to? Oh gosh, um, I don't think so. I I don't know what it is because I've I've had people ask me before, like, how did you get to that thought process? Like, yes, well, that's, I don't know. 
Yeah, because I, I feel like people aren't just born with that for sure. Well, I mean, like you could be, but like you have to like train it and be better at it. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if something necessarily happened to me that really like made me think I can try again. I think from like a young age, my parents, like if I messed up, they were just like, all right, well, like try again. Mm, okay. You no, know? um, they had this thing of like, well, did you do your best? Well, it is what it is. All right, let's let's try it again. Now, if I didn't do my best, they're like, "Well, Charles, you need to work harder." Like, come on, seriously. Uh, but I, I don't have like a defining moment where I was like, "Okay, like I can always try again. I can always do it again." I figure like there's. Oh, I, I guess I did read one book. I don't I don't remember where I learned this from, but most of the problems that we have in life have a beginning and have an end. Right. So like. Put a college degree, for example. The start of a college degree is zero college credits, and the end of a college degree is 120 credits. So there's there's a, a finite thing. There's a start and there's an end. Now, if if we're thinking about like if college is a game, if there's a start to the game and there's an end of the game, and then I'm an, there's a finite game. Now I'm an infinite player. Uh, compared to a college degree, I you know I'm not constrained there is no start and end to charles i mean i guess i can be born and, buy and die but opposed to a college degree i'm an infinite player so if i get two credits a year for 60 years i will have a college degree and so if i don't stop i will always be successful mm. it's not a function of if it's a function of when and so I think about it like this, almost every problem I have in life, I'm an infinite player and there's a finite game, meaning it's not when I'm going to make this or earn this or achieve this accomplishment or, you know, get this fit, right? Like it's when I'm going to get there. And the when is a function of like hard work and luck and preparation and opportunity and, and time. And so to me, I read that somewhere. Um, it's not the Simon Sinek book. I, I knew it before that. He's got a book called The Infinite Game. I've heard it from somewhere else way before um, he wrote that. And that kind of put it in my logic. Like that put words to what my brain has always thought of. Like I can always keep trying again and like eventually I will get there. And so if I just keep working, I will get wherever I want. And so I think a lot of people really just stop and there's the, there's this meme. There's like these two guys, and they're digging for gold, and they're like right on top of each other. I've seen that one. Okay, you know exactly what I'm I've talking seen, about. Yes, it's like one's almost there. The other one's. I saw that meme. Yeah, the one one's almost there, and he's like tired, and he and he's right towards the goal. He's like an inch gold, and he puts he puts the pickaxe down, and he just looks exhausted, and he it looks like he's turning back away from the goal. Yes. And then there's another guy who's not as close, who is like dashing like a madman. He's got the pickaxe behind him, and he's ready to just go hit the gold. And my buddy sent me that like maybe two years ago. He sent me that image. And every time people talk about mindset, I think of that image. Just um, you're almost there. Like you, if you stop now, you are not going to get that gold. Yeah. And if you always think like that. Man, that's, that's a good way to think. You will, you will always get to where you want to go if you just don't stop. Right. If you record, you know, 100,000 podcast episodes, one of them will go viral. I promise you. Right. If you only record one, man, your chances are really low. It better be really good. <laughs> and so like, just keep going. That's hey, it. That's, that's very, no, that's very interesting. Cause I'm no, that I've stopped and I, I'm not saying I was at next to gold, but I've stopped on several ventures in my life and just turned around, went to the next thing. But you could have been next to gold. I could have, you been don't know. Gold. I know. Did you hit gold? No, because I turned around. Right. But like, do you know where the goal, if you didn't hit it, you don't know where it is. So it could have been the next thing. Or the first thing, if I would have stuck with it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, like, I don't know, maybe yeah, it so really could be. That's a good point. Cause it's like the going, the going is always going to get tough. No matter what you do, you could, no matter what business venture you get into, no matter what project you're doing, school, work offers, even offers are a pain in like the, the ass, you know what I mean? When, Creating, yeah. creating an offer like you just want to be like okay next offer so i mean even even stuff that i've made it's like all right i think this is great does does the market think it's great right and 
you know, like I would buy this, would they? You know, sometimes there's things that I like that the market hates and there's some things the market loves that I think are stupid. But, you know, that's why you let the market decide, not you. <laughs> So I have a question. Do you do you consider yourself a strategic thinker? Strategic meaning like you're planning like and, and I, I do have like uh, I'm curious, like how 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 far along do you think someone should be planning? You know, what I mean, like, should they plan like years ahead? Like, did like uh, some like I think it's Sam Ovens or or um, Charlie Morgan. They say you need like you need to plan your vision. Basically, you need to plan like like the vision of what you want your your life to be. Like, do you, how, how do you think about that? Okay. So I, I think in, in two, two kind of separate ways. Right. And so the first one is like, I have, I have long-term goals. Okay. And I read this somewhere is people who have long-term, what is it? I'm going to butcher these stats. So someone's going to go look it up and be like, Charles, you're wrong. <laughs> um, so I'm going to preface I'm, I'm wrong already, but the stats are directionally correct. So they did a study at like Harvard and like 80% of people had no goal. And like 20% of people who had a goal um, got like most of the results, right? They got like 80% of the results. And then 3% of the people who wrote down their goal got better results than everybody else combined. Mm. And so uh, when I was, I don't know, like 2010, 2011, now nah, maybe it was like 2000, yeah, 2010, 2011, I wrote down goals. Okay. And I wrote them like one, three, five, ten, and lifetime year goals, and I put it in a plaque, or I put it in like a uh, a picture frame. Mm. And so I put these goals in a picture frame, and I signed the bottom of it. And so I typed it up in Word, signed the bottom of it, put it in a frame, put it in my room. Forgot about it. Uh, I went back to my parents' house, and you know, of course, like everyone knows, after you move out, like. Every couple of years, your parents are like, oh, here's a box of your stuff. Have fun. Like, put it in your house. Thanks. Um, so I got one of those those beautiful packages where I'm like, oh, we're going to put all this stuff. And I look through the box, and there's that plot. There's the, uh, the picture frame with my goals in it. And so that was 2010, 2011. It's 2024 now. I accomplished every single thing on that list or better that I set out to do. The only things I, I didn't do is climb Mount Everest. Um, did, but uh, all the other things. Did the book mention to write it down? The one you, the one you read? No, no, I just did this. I was okay. like, I gotta have goals. I'm going to write them down and make a commitment to myself. You know how people frame their like first dollar that they made in business. Yes. I was like, well, I'm going to frame my goals. And, and so and I, I'm, I'm curious that you had, you just had that mindset. Like it was not taught to you. No. Interesting. Yeah, it's don't I don't mindset. know I don't, I don't know where I learned this, but yeah. I was just like like it was like I'm going to get a top MBA, I'm going to work at one of the, you know, the best places to work and I'm going to earn this amount of money and I am going to, you know, have this car and I'm going to go skydiving and I'm going to learn to cook and like all these things. Like they weren't just like money. It's like, well, I've been skydiving, I've been scuba diving. Like I learned to cook, right? Like I no longer live in mom and dad's house. I got to cook for myself. Um, you know, I like got a, a fancy degree. I worked as one of the best companies to work for. Like I've, I've earned six and seven figures. Like I've done those things. Cool. Those are all my goals. Um, but like, I also like got to develop loving relationships and friendships. And so like that was on there. And so all my goals, I either met or way exceeded. And I think if you were going to have long-term goals, like write out what you're going to do, write out what you're going to do, make a commitment to yourself. And then like break those up into small steps. So like, I, you know, I'm a finance guy. So I have like a business plan and one month, three month, you know, six month, 12 month goals and all the steps to get there. Um, and that, that's like a, that's like a big deal. So when I think of goals, like that's, that's what I do. And like speak your truth out in the universe. If you say it out loud, it has a much better chance of, of staying true than if you don't say it out loud. Like what's, what's something that you have like a goal that like you, you, that like it scares you to say it out loud. My goal. Yeah. It sounds scary to say it out loud. You're like, oh man, I don't, I don't want to yeah, put yeah. this. No, I'm, I'm going to say it right now, but it is scary the way you say it. I want to make $5 million per year in business. Okay. Is that profit or revenue? That or is uh total revenue. Okay. Total revenue. So you got to be specific on these things. Okay. 
Okay. Because what, what if you spend 4 million, 999,099 cents, dude, you made one penny. <laughs> All right. So profit, how much do you want to take? Profit, home? I, want it, I want it to be 60% profit margins. Okay. So you want to take home 60% profit margins. So that's $3 million. So you want to put $3 million in your pocket. How much is that a month? Ooh, see, that's $249,000 a month. Right, three million divided by twelve. All right, yeah, two hundred two hundred fifty thousand dollars a month. Yeah, that that goal scares me. So you want to put two hundred fifty thousand? So you want to be able to buy a starter home, not not in South Florida, maybe, maybe probably not in Austin either. But you want to be able to buy a starter home somewhere in the country every single month. Yes. Okay. That's a good goal. So you should count your revenue and number of houses you can buy per month. <laughs> I like. I didn't. I never thought about that, but that's that's pretty cool. Finance. Uh, I, I do have some some questions about finance. Uh, uh, let's roll. One because I literally grew up and uh, like we we talked about in the, in the first uh, segment, which was like they don't teach you finance in school. No. So we're literally destined to fail. Um, yeah. Do you believe that someone who knows finance is has a better chance of success than someone who just goes to school to be a doctor or like a lawyer. Uh, okay. So, I mean, like doctors, lawyers, and finance people, we all kind of think we're smarter than each other. So obviously like, I'm going to, I'm going to definitely state that. Like we kind of, kind of rub, rub shoulders, throw engineers in there too, if you want. Um, well, the, re the reason I say this is because like you get NBA stars. I can even put NBA in there. Is you like, you get like NBA star boxers, things like that. Mm -hmm. They make massive amounts of money. Mike Tyson, for instance. And then next thing you know, they lose it all. And then they fight people like Jake Paul. I'm I'm really excited to see Mike Tyson <laughs> kick the absolute crap out of Jake Paul. I don't know if he's if he's going to throw the fight. I really hope he doesn't. But I would love to. Still, I'm I'm very excited for that. I don't I don't know when that comes out. I'll have to um, look it up. July twentieth. I'm not promoting this fight. So, <laughs> <laughs> but but I but if you are, pay him an affiliate commission. Yeah, <laughs> I will be uh, watching the fight for sure. Free on it's free on Netflix. Oh really? Yes, free on Netflix. Oh, oh shoot! All right, all right. Well, I know what I'm doing. July 20th for sure. I'll throw a little little party at my house. Everybody's invited. Um, sorry, what was the question? Oh, uh, like yeah. knowing about money? Yeah, money. Because like you get you get people like I said, you get the 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 boxers, you get the NBA stars, and they make tons and tons of money. But they were like even them. Like you would think people like at their level, they're super successful. They ended up blow, blowing all of it. So what's been really helpful to me and like I do, I do fractional CFO work for people who own businesses. So I have clients who make $20 million a year in revenue who come to me and have no idea what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Like Damn. no idea what they're doing. You'd think they would, but they don't, um, which is okay because they're good at selling the thing or doing the thing, but the finances are said thing, not so good. And that's okay. But if you know your numbers and you understand finance, nobody can take advantage of you. It's like a car and a mechanic and, uh, a, and a woman. <laughs> <laughs> Both of those are going to take advantage of you because there's something <laughs> called information asymmetry is they know a hell of a lot more than you do about those things. Um, <laughs> especially the second one. Those are dangerous. Um, all, all, all jokes, all jokes aside. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Joking, don't cancel us, please. I dude, I'm I'm married. My wife's not going anywhere. You can't <laughs> you can't you gee, yeah, she's an amazing woman. You can't cancel me on that. Um <laughs> so it's it's exactly like going to the mechanic. If you out you go out and you get a loan or you sell some equity in your business or you raise some debt, if you're sitting across the table from somebody like me versus somebody who doesn't have that experience. If I want to act unethically, what's going to stop you? You don't even know what I could do or what I couldn't do. Mm. You know, you hear about all these times where people get loans like merchant cash advances or other things and they think it's a good deal. And then I show them the math and it's not. They're like, well, it, it made sense at the time. And I'm like, yeah, well, that's why you don't have any money. And so one of the things that it's really important to me is like intellectual honesty. Or, or, or the lack of intellectual dishonesty. And so, which is, is like, if you're engaging someone in business 
if people don't understand what you're doing, you can hide what you're doing. So like people go to the, go to the car dealership all the time. And there's always the joke of like the, the, the guy in the military who goes and gets the, the Hellcat at 30% interest rate and all this other stuff. Um, you know, just like the, the joke of that is like the finance guy at the car dealership is taking advantage of the people there. And so a lot of people don't know that, that they may be taken advantage of, they may not be based upon the credit, whatever. But if you know your finances, you're going to know how to operate your business. You're going to have an idea of what to do next to change your business. And no one's going to be able to take advantage of you. And luckily, like not everyone in the world is going to take advantage of you who knows more about you on the subject. Otherwise, I could never get my car fixed. I could never go to the doctor, right? Not everyone's out to get you. But if you know just enough to be dangerous, you know when something doesn't really make sense. And as much as it's important for everyone to know your finances, like that's, that's why you hire people like me, but you need to know enough to be dangerous, maybe not enough to be an expert. And you can, that can be so powerful um, because A, you'll never get caught with your pants down. B, like you'll know when to hire someone and be like, all right, like I know enough to know that this isn't good. I need someone to get here and to like do all the, all the math for me. And so. And is there a book really you important. recommend to get to know that level? Like just to get that basic understanding or course or like just. No, you, I no? mean, You're, I've, we're screwed. I've, we're screwed. if you, if you saw my wall over here, it's full of finance textbooks. So if I could like distill those down, that would be great. I, I've thought about doing like a, a finance free commerce dummies kind of course. Um, that would be helpful, but I haven't seen anything that's just like, a general introduction that I would recommend mm, okay. um, to other people. Uh, oddly enough, Khan Academy has a bunch of finance courses and those are free. Uh, I took those back in the day. That's helpful. But any sort of education you can get, like get your hands on it, like get, get reading. It's not sexy. It's not fun. Um, but what you can unlock by all that knowledge, the results of that is fun. It's sexy. You could do, you know, whatever you want, your fancy car or house or, you know, the, the freedom for time and energy. Um, I would just get educated, but I don't have a specific resource I would point people to. Got it. So it's an interesting question I have. So coaches like, um, so say like a coach or consultant is they're growing their business, right? They have their offer. They finally start making some progress. At what point should like they start spending money on advertising? I mean, my thought is immediately. <laughs> immediately. So like even at the first 10,000, 20,000. Yeah. 5,000. Yeah. Okay. Cause most people think like, okay, I, like, cause I, I talk, I've talked to a, several coaches and consultants. I see them in groups and stuff like that. And they're like, okay, well I'm only making like five, 10 K a month. I can't spend money on advertising yet. I need to do everything organically. So, I mean, unless you're like one of the guys who are really good at organic, which I'm not, mm -hmm. that's fine. Uh, like I, I started a new offer and like granted, like, I've got a couple dollars. I've got some credit. Like, you know, it's fine. Um, but it was profitable the very first month I started running ads. So, you know, like I would, I would get out there and start running ads immediately, you know, get in front of calls, make sure you're, you're like calls are, you know, like a, like a decent cost. Um, but as long as you have a good offer and you can start running ads and get in front of people, like I would do that immediately. I mean, yeah, do the whole organic thing. And again, this isn't my experience, but like to get to 50, you know, thousand dollars a month with ads is not hard. Like it's not just get good at getting people on the phone and get good at selling them. And, you know, if you can get 20 people on the phone, uh, you know, sorry, I'll do easy math, 10 people on the phone for less than half the cost of whatever your thing is that you're selling. Well, you're, you're almost guaranteed to make money. Right. If you sell something that's imaginary numbers, you know, 10 people on the phone. And even if your calls are, are $500 a piece, that's five grand. Okay. You only need to sell one of them to double your money. So why wouldn't you spend money on ads right now? By the way, $500 a call is really expensive. And a 10% conversion rate is also bad. So granted, there's like the show rate or whatever, which I'm not like getting into, but like, if we look at that math, why wouldn't you start today? You heard that. Start today. 
Um, I mean, really? Yeah, like, yeah, why, yeah. Why didn't you? What do you see that? What do you see? You work with a lot of businesses. What do you see that holds businesses back? And I'm not just talking about advertising specifically. Like, what do you see the most common thing that's holding them back from really getting to that next level? Um, I think I was watching. Who was I watching? Um, it was it was a group, a mastermind group that I was a part of. But a lot of them were like, everyone wants to go to like the next level. So it's like you want to go from like 50 to 100k. So mm -hmm. like, what what do you think really holds them back from like? getting to those levels is it because they set a small small goal in the first place uh so it's a different thing at every like level and also for different businesses i'll talk for like e-commerce owners um for like the small guys like i, I just got off the phone with a lady super nice so just amazing woman super cool they've got a really nice brand they're really small like really 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 small and so they told me their sales goal and i was like oh per month She's like, no, that's for the year. I was like, oh, um, why did you pick that number? What made you say that? Mm. She's like, well, I think it's doable. I go, okay, like what? What do you think is scary? Kind of like what I just did with you. Yeah, what's like, what, what's scary? She's like, oh, well, I guess that number per month. I go, okay, cool. Well, I have every client except one is doing more than that per month. And why, and why do we, just, why do you think we pick, why do you think? Cause like I've even, it was, I even have done that before. Like I'm thinking like small numbers, like 10 K, like I want to make 10 K per month type stuff. Okay. But even with 10 K a month, okay. Pay for ads, pay for software, pay for taxes. How much is left for you to have? Like two grand. Yeah. Okay. You live in Austin, Texas, right? Correct. What does that get you in Austin, Texas? A McFlurry. <laughs> Yeah, not shit. <laughs> it gets you much. It gets you riding a scooter to work, back and forth okay. to work. Okay, cool. So like, that's great. But does that change your life? Not really. Okay, so that ten. What does that ten need to be? Probably like a hundred. Okay. So how about how about you? How about you fail your way to a hundred, and you'll just happen to pass ten on the way there. <clears throat> different different sort of thinking huh it is yeah so back back to the thing is why do people why do you think we pick those small numbers i'm curious oh gosh yeah. i'm sorry whenever i hear small number my brain just doesn't want to believe it um that's why i immediately go on that exercise I'm like Wrong. that's that one percent yeah. you get that's that one percenter mindset the, the um, man, i don't even i mean people just people just they want to do what's safe okay yeah but like mm. even even like picking the 10k example that doesn't actually get them what they want but they 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 think it's safe so they go ahead and do it and they think it's believable mm. like you can do what you believe so if you just change what you believe, which again, like it sounds like you're gaslighting yourself, but it kind of is true and it kind of works. So do it. Um, people pick those small numbers because they're afraid. Maybe they have weird beliefs about money. They think they're not worth it. They think they're not good enough. They're not smart enough. This person over here is making all this money and I'm not like them or, you know, like I've had I'll... that mentality too, that like the, that, that, that the person I'm learning from is way smarter than I am. <laughs> like, yeah, but that's not true. I know. That's I not know. true at all. I'm just saying, like, that's the kind of mindset mm -hmm. that I can see because I'm like looking up to him like a god. I'm like, oh, like you're the. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a problem. I feel like we have in the like the online information space. So like that guy who's doing a hundred million a year, he puts on his pants the exact same way I put on my pants, the same way you put on your pants, one leg at a time. And so if you think about it, like. I, so I don't I don't know the numbers, but like the smartest person you've ever met, and you, they're not that much smarter. Maybe they're ten percent smarter than you at most. At most. Mm. At most. So if the smartest person you've ever met has only ten percent more raw brain power than you, first of all, is the smartest person you've ever met also getting the best results that you've ever seen? The answer is probably not. I wouldn't, so, you wouldn't know though, because you don't really, you can't really see into their business. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not, not exactly. But I've seen some businesses that are really large. And let me tell you, they, they are not the smartest people that I've ever met. 
Are they like, uh, so sure. is, is it like, um, who is that guy? Henry Ford. Is it like the Henry Ford type thing where he's not really that smart, but he was able to like pull levers of the smartest people he had around him and be like, okay, I'm not smart, but like I could just call this guy and he knows the answer for you. I mean, that's part of it, but I, I think of it like this. Like if you want to be um, successful, like not being smart enough doesn't really matter because there's not a big difference between like our average intelligence between people. So if between you and the smartest person you've ever met, there's this much of a difference being smart enough, can't hold you back. Right. If there's a, if there's a, you know, a 10 or 100 times difference in his results to your results, but he's only 10% smarter. Okay. So it's not that. So he must be doing something different. He must have a different mindset. He must be thinking different. There's also people who are not as smart as you who have much better results. Same thing for me. And so like we have all these weird beliefs and I think people have all these weird irrational beliefs that come from our parents, come from trauma, generational things, things that we happen to as kids, weird beliefs that are not true. We all have beliefs that we like, if I say them out loud, I'm like, Charles, it's dumb, <laughs> but we believe it anyhow. Um, and that's where like, going to therapy and hiring a coach and all that stuff goes through. Um, I was, I was, I was on a call with a, with a guy in my space last night and super cool guy. He was like, the biggest thing that holds my clients back is their mindset. And I was like, yeah, same, same here. Okay. So that's what holds people back from getting into success. That's what stops people. That's why they pick those low numbers is, is just, it goes back to their mindset, man. They just need to change it. I hate to give that answer, but it's yeah. So if it's the biggest thing people can take away from this, literally this whole conversation is change your mindset. We, we had a, my wife and I had a conversation the other day and she's like, Charles, we think in really big numbers. I was like, well, what do you mean? She's like, oh, well, I'm trying to do this in my business and blah, blah, blah. Like she runs Google ads for a living. Right. And, um, you know, she was like, oh, it's just, it's, it's just like $70,000 a month. It's like not a lot. Um, of like what she was talking about. And I'm like, Hey, you, you realize like most households, not people, but households in America only make about 48 to $52,000 a year. So $70,000 a month is a lot. It's an insane amount of money. And and she said that out loud. And I, I don't remember like what she was specifically talking about, but we become, when you get to a point where your mindset is elevated, large numbers just don't phase you anymore. And you're like, all right, I, I only did 60 K this month. I'm trying to be at 120, like, damn it. And so just thinking bigger and you'll reach a lot higher. Like if that's, that's like the biggest cheat code is the theory of next, which is if bad things happen, just go next. I'll try it again and think bigger than you've ever thought. And you'll make bigger decisions. Hmm. That's that's if people get anything out of our, our conversations, it's just shoot higher than you think you deserve. And I promise you, you will get past where you, you think you deserve and past where you want to be. And it's it's worked for me. I, I found it thinking like that by accident. But like your life kind of changes into whatever you make it and you'll start making those decisions like unconsciously. That's powerful. I want to like end it right there I, I wish i could pull my mic and just like drop it because like that was like <laughs> that, was a, that was a good that was very good no I, I love that um perfect perfect to wrap up the show perfect thanks man i appreciate it yes sir appreciate it